I did start out in January. This was one of my first classes to attend um, when I came here to Ferris, um, sat in this class and was like, all right, I just gotta get through it, right? I didn't really know what um, school full time was gonna look like, because um, as I'll talk about, I worked for 15 years before deciding to come back to school. Um, so I was just kind of coming to get a degree. Little did I know my life would change and I would be a grad student looking to go on to be a professor. Um, so before I worked at Hope Network, I did, um, I worked with mentally ill adults. I was a program manager there for 15 years, almost 15 years. Um, and then I also worked at Turning Point for um, substance abuse. And during that time, I kind of still had my love for sports, always going to sporting events, doing what I could do in order to stay involved in the world of sports. I coached a JV softball team at um, my, like where I went to school when I was younger, just kind of trying to stay involved in sports and trying to continue on. I took night classes at GRCC because I knew I wanted to do schooling, but I knew when I was 18, 19, schooling wasn't for me. Like I needed to be doing something else and kind of figuring out things. Um, so fast forward through those 15 years, taking night classes here and there periodically, I all of a sudden was faced with the fact that I needed to graduate with my associate and move on. Like my friend was an advisor at CC and she was like, go, like get out of CC, go on, do something. And so that started my, my journey. Um, and I looked around, you know, I worked full time. I was planning on continuing to work full time. I was, you know, figuring out where I could commute from, from Grand Rapids, that had a program that I'd be interested in. And I did find the Recreation Management and Leadership Program um, up here. I came up here um, one day during the summer, met with the advisor over there, and went back home and said, I'm quitting my full-time job and going to school full-time because I want to get into athletics. Like, I was going to work in athletics. That's what I was going to do. I was going to take my two years here, work in athletics, get a job at a D2 school or a high school even was an option. Um, but I didn't really know what that looked like. Um, so I went through the process of applying, getting accepted, um, Moving on, and then life at Ferris State started in January of 2011. Um, and what I didn't know then was that sitting in this class was going to dramatically change the direction that my life was gonna go. Um, the cool thing was I was able to work with athletics, right? Being here, I'm sure you guys have had opportunities to work with um, John Coles over in the athletic department. Um, those kind of things. I talked to Marie um, Foster, who was the softball coach there. So I spent my final semester here um, coaching with the softball team, um, traveling with them, doing that kind of stuff. Prior to that, I did um, game management for John Coles. So I was at all the football games, the basketball games, um, whatever he kind of needed in the department. Um, to help out. And I also worked with Sarah Higley, the compliance director, for a short time. And during that time, I kind of got to learn more about Title IX. I got to learn more about compliance. And that kind of started the ball rolling as to where my research was going to lead me. So a lot of the things that I did here at Ferris really kind of prepared me and set me up without me knowing I was going on for a master's degree at the beginning. But it kind of started setting some paths. Um, and then we got involved in conferencing. So this was our first conference away. We went to Central States um, and presented. Dr. A convinced the three of us that going to conferencing would be fun. It would be an experience that we'd never forget. And all of our papers generated out of this class. So the format was very different um, for her first semester of teaching 389 than it is now. Um, so we, we wrote a lot more papers versus project based. Um, and so we were able to do conferencing. We were able to go out and meet people. And 
it was at this conference that I first started talking with um, graduate directors. So I met um, Beth Wagensback from Virginia Tech at this conference, and that kind of planted the seed that, huh, there's life after. I can still be a student. It's going to be interesting. Um, we were involved in the RSO here on campus and got to meet Ira and um, this is Greg um, and Kelser. And um, so we, you know, we did a lot of those events. We just became pretty active. The three of us were active and then um, there's Kay Kaylee's in, in there. She's the, one of the tall ones over there. It was kind of the four of us that were the first kind of group to um, take on the RSO. But being active, getting involved, um, Dr. A would ask us to do things and we're like, okay, so we did poster presentations here, we've gone to conferences, um, Dr. A talked me into applying for the International Association for Communication and Sports Conference. Um, little did we know that undergrads hadn't presented at that conference before. Um, so I was the first undergrad to go to that conference and present. Um, which was an amazing, oh, that's my internship, which was an amazing process because you get to meet like Andrew Billings and Michael Butterworth and these guys that I had been reading and doing research on and reading their, their published work and I got to meet them at the conference and here I am a senior um, at Ferris and starting the application process, actually when I got to Texas is when I found out that I was going on for my master's. I got the phone call right after I checked into the hotel saying, congratulations, you've been accepted to Virginia Tech. Um, and that they would be calling me with more details later. Um, so that was a interesting process. The other interesting thing and the opportunity that Ferris State offered me was an opportunity to spend three and a half months in Hawaii. Um, being a recreation management uh, major, I was able to go over there and work at a camp on Oahu for three and a half months, which was just amazing, um, being on the island. I got to do sporting activities um, and then do some more of the recreation, kayaking, snorkeling, and all of those kind of things um, while I was in Hawaii. And my senior project was creating a marketing um, project for the camp to develop kind of how they could market themselves. Get, they were kind of starting to lose more money and you know, with the economy, it was kind of struggling. So I revamped the whole um, marketing program for them. Um, so all of these things kind of had started setting me up for my grad school experience. Being able to be away from home, because now I was going down to Virginia, what was that gonna look like, um, being away from home? What was you know, it gonna entail? Um, being in Dr. A's classes, they're writing intensive. I'm sure you've had her for other classes. It gets pretty writing intensive, which is all wonderful things that have led me down the path. So we finally got to graduation in May of 2013. Um, and at that point, I was signed and committed to Virginia Tech. So I was going on to get my master's degree at Virginia Tech. A word of advice that I got from one of the professors over in recreation management was, don't ever pay for your advanced degrees. So whatever you can do to not pay for an advanced degree, do it. Um, and I was like, who, who pays people to come to school, right? Like, how does that work? Um, and you can do it in numerous ways. Um, I was able to do it through a teaching assistantship. Um, so I was a GTA for public speaking at Virginia Tech. Um, that meant that I taught two sections of public speaking each semester. And in each class, I had 40 students. Um, and they kind of do it in a hybrid type model where we're online for some, half of it and half of, you, half of it you're in class. So you're only except for on lecture days, like working with 20 students at a time. Um, but it was kind of an interesting experience. So Virginia Tech 
is one of the most beautiful campuses that I've ever been on. Um, so when I got down there, it was learning a whole new world because, you know, Ferris is a pretty small campus. You can get around it pretty quickly. Um, getting down to Virginia Tech, it was a large, I would almost compare it to a Michigan State campus because U of M is kind of Ann Arbor, center of Ann Arbor, but MSU is a little bit more spread out and that was this campus. Um, so we got down there a week before classes started and we were given our syllabus for all of our classes, expected to have you know, our books and be ready to go. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, we do that all the time, right? Grad school steps it up. They do expect you to have your reading done on day one of class. They do expect you to kind of be prepared. Um, and then also, I got at Virginia Tech, I was able to go through kind of what they call a boot camp for teaching. So they would, we would have a week long intensive, like here's your script for teaching, here's what you're doing when you're in the classroom, here's your website, your Blackboard site, all of that kind of stuff. And you kind of just, you're, you're not thrown in, but you're like, all right, have fun in the classroom, right? This is my first time ever teaching. And so I'm like, what does this look like? Okay, I'm gonna go with my presentation style, right? So you give a lot of presentations at, at, at an undergrad. So I figured it had to be something like that, um, getting up in front of the classroom. On top of teaching, you're also required to start doing your own research. Um, for Virginia Tech, the only line of, uh, for a master's is doing a thesis. Um, so you have to produce a paper at the end of your time there. Some schools have it where you can do a project or a thesis. If you're going master's terminal, um, I know at UT, at University of Tennessee, you can do a, a, a project, but it's very hard to get into a doc program later on if you've done the project versus writing a thesis. It's not impossible, but it's a little bit harder to do. Um, so if you're going on, I highly recommend the thesis route. Um, even if you feel like master's is terminal, that's where you wanna end, um, your schooling is at the master's level, it still might be wise to do the thesis because if later on down the road you're like, mm, maybe I do wanna get that doctoral degree and now I wanna teach because I have all of this life experience that I'm ready to pass on. Um, so I was still involved with athletics um, at Virginia Tech. I got into the mentoring and um, student engagement center. So at the D1 schools, they have a uh, academic center which helps with scheduling, tutoring, mentoring, um, all of their student athletes. They have study halls that they're required and mandated to go to in there. And um, so that was my avenue into sports at that, at that level. Um, I didn't have the time commitment to do like game management that I did um, when I was here. So I was like, what else can I do? Because I still want to work with athletics. I still want to look at how um, sports are affected. And so I was able to get into the mentor program and I worked with the volleyball team and the softball team uh, through that. So I was still able to kind of touch base with my sports roots and um, being involved in athletics. But now I had to step up research. And where was I gonna go with research? I had several of Dr. Osbaugh's classes and we touched on diversity, we've touched on sports. Um, I worked in the compliance office. I was kind of seeing more of the compliance um, issues when I was doing the mentorship in, um, in the academic department. So I started to gravitate towards Title IX. Um, Title IX is very much a focus, even more so now in my research. But as in my, um, in my master's classes, I started making it all about Title IX. I was learning the history of Title IX. I was doing how is it implemented in athletics, how is it implemented in, at the college level um, because Title IX is not all about athletics. Um, but I was still interested in how it was affecting the athlete, athletics at that time. Um, so even though Virginia Tech wasn't a sports communication based masters, 
I still made all of my research about sports. I talked about sports in every class. All of my cohort was like, yeah, 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 it's sports again, we get it. Like, we're, we're talking about sports, we're talking about Title IX, um, kind of stuff. And so that, I went in with a very much focused agenda of research. So studying um, the bottom corner picture, that became my lit review um, for my, my thesis. Um, my cat, my study buddy, who still is my study buddy, um, spent many long hours reading. Um, I think there we're reading organization communication and writing a paper about athletic departments and how um, they're structured and how the, um, they communicate um, through there and how women and the SWA position fits into the organizational structure um, there. And then my office and my desk, um, I don't know if you can see the, the little writing on the wall, but that's the, the 37 words that compose Title IX um, were up as well, just to remind me of where I was going. Um, so thesis, um, so there's my thesis title. I really wanted to look at how female athlete, athletic directors reported barriers, pathways, and mentoring. You know, because reading a lot of literature and stuff talks about how male uh, athletic directors always have that mentor. They are always um, helped up on their way through. But I wanted to know if that was the same for female athletic directors in NCA schools. Um, and so I sent out a survey to every female athletic director um, across all three divisions of NCAA. And I got 110 responses back out of 336 female athletic directors. Um, so that still ends up being over 20% response rate. Um, and was pretty decent turnout. Um, I would have liked to get more, and I probably could have if I had more time. Um, but with the Virginia Tech program, you're a two years and out the door um, program. So they really rush you to kind of get your data. Um, and what I found is the typical barriers are there, the glass ceiling, the um, good old boys club, you know, all of those barriers are pretty much there. Their pathways have been varied. Um, a lot of the older females who are in there are there because they kind of got grandfathered in when NCAA took over female um, ath athletics. And so they kind of got snaked through. Others have come up through the coaching ranks. Um, and then a few have kind of come in and through administration and been able to work their way up. Um, one of the things that they talked about in the um, qualitative part of it, and they talked about that there's not really a mentorship program. Um, women are very much not willing to help each other out. Um, and so they would like to see more of that um, in kind of, you know, being a supportive um, partner to others. Um, that are wanting to kind of make those leaps and bounds, um, but none of them really had suggestions on how to make that happen. Um, and a couple of the organizations are trying to do that, but not actively um, doing a lot of it. Um, so that was really where my thesis took me. Um, so I really focused on female athletic directors, how that was working. Um, and I compared it a lot to higher ed in general. Um, just, you know, the, the backstabbing, the not working well together um, kind of comes out in higher ed as well. Um, tokenism is another term that was kind of thrown around. I like being the only female at the table. Um, it kind of gives me a sense of power. Everybody knows who I am type things. And so um, those were just kind of some of, some of the findings for that. During this process, I was talked into um, applying for a PhD program. Um, and I wasn't really sure how that was gonna work, so I quick did my research, 
ran around to a bunch of different colleges, made phone calls to a bunch of different colleges, talked to different professors who I thought maybe I could work with who would be interested in pursuing um, my thesis work with me because um, I thought that would be an easy track to kind of bring forward into my, my doctoral work. Um, so I looked at Minnesota and Mary Jo Kane in the um, Tucker Center, the Women's uh, Sports and Research Center up in Minnesota. I looked at Ohio State, nope, University of Ohio, right, uh, Dr. Butterworth, working with him. Um, I looked at Alabama, and then I looked at University of Tennessee, um, and I went over and met with Dr. Erin Whiteside, who looks at, um, not just, but she does a lot of work with Title IX and sports journalists, and how media coverage of women's sports, how our women who are sports journalists being able to break through those barriers, um, and that's a kind of like where a lot of her research falls, and I thought that would be a great, a great relationship, and you know, they say that your, your tree, your family tree, when you get into academics is very important. So, you know, who, who's your advisor, who's your advisor's advisor is kind of your academic family tree um, is super important. And she was at Penn State and with Marie Harding, who is another fabulous um, researcher in women's sports. And um, so kind of following that train, um, I applied to, all, all four of those schools, um, heard back from Minnesota and I didn't get in, um, heard back from uh, there was another school in there, I can't think of who it was. Um, I heard back from them and I didn't get in. So getting pretty discouraged at this point, the application process, um, not really thinking that things are going go my way, so what was gonna be my backup plan? Um, oh, graduation day, forgot about that. Then I finally get the email that says, welcome to University of Tennessee's PhD program. And that, A, made my day, because I finally had gotten into a program. I was going to, become, going to go to school where the legendary Pat Summit coached. Um, and while she wasn't coaching anymore, she was still very present in the culture, the campus, um, she was at every basketball game up until um, the, towards the end of the season. But it was like a, a, a dream come true because I was going to go to a college that, that uh, um, respected women's sports. Um, and so I thought research would be something that I could really dive into um, there. Boy, oh boy, did my interest change. So Dr. Whiteside works in the journalism and electronic media um, department. And so that is where I ended up getting accepted into. The College of Communication and Information is broken up into four schools. So we have the School of Journalism, Electronic Media. We have Com Studies. Um, we have PR and Advertising. And then we have Information Sciences, which is kind of library studies um, type thing. Um, and so, I was going into journalism, electronic media, not really knowing anything about journalism, electronic media. It wasn't where I wanted to study. It wasn't what I knew, but I was willing to say yes to anything, and I would figure it out. Um, so I got my teaching assignment for UT, and it was media writing for mass media. And it's going to be the intro class that all journalism students take to learn about writing as a journalist. So <laughs> I was like, well, I, can I go back to public speaking? And this is from a person who does not like public speaking, or did not like public speaking um, when I got that um, offer, but had really grown into it. And, but the challenge was there, I was gonna do it, um, so I did a lot of reading research, um, talked to professors at Virginia Tech who kind of did some of the journalism, writing for mass media classes, got some references, got some books from them, um, took a mass comm theory course um, in order to prepare myself to go into it. Because um, at Virginia Tech, you have to take coursework your whole time while you're there. 
Um, you get like six hours um, your final semester to work on thesis, but otherwise you have to be in classes for like 12, hour, 12 credit hours um, for, for the semesters. Um, so I, I did some stuff to prepare um, going into this. And when I got there, I was given a 50-50 um, uh, assistantship. So 50% of my time is spent in the classroom. So that's about 20 hours a week. And then my other 20 hours a week are doing RA duties. So that is a research um, assistant. And so my advisor, who also happens to be who I do research for, is Dr. Whiteside, um, and who I really wanted to work with when I was there. So it all kind of worked out well that I did get assigned to her. She is my mentor. She is my advisor. And she's also my research partner. Um, so I do re whatever her research agenda is, though, is what I work on during those hours. So if she has a project that she wants me to work on, I do that. Um, so I've done coding. I've done, um, she had me go through and check to make sure all of her citations were there for a book chapter that she was doing and her reference sheet was up to date. So just kind of like her, her busy work that she maybe doesn't have time to do. Um, but for the research part of it, I also, um, for most of the work, get second authorship, which is pretty cool. So anything that we get published out of that, I'll get a pub as well, a publication credit as well, um, which is really important as you move through the doctoral program. The more you can, the more publications you have going out onto the job market, the more marketable you kind of become. So we, I get there, I figure out my teaching um, load. I don't get a boot camp um, like I did for Virginia Tech. So this is the first time I'm told, create your own schedule, figure out your assignments, set up your Blackboard page and have it all done in a week because you're, you're going live, right? Um, so we, we scramble as a cohort to, to kind of figure out our lives um, as what that's going to look like. But mind you, we're also balancing classes. So at University of Tennessee in the doc program, you do two full years of classwork and then you have a year of dissertation with comps in between. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So when I talked about um, classes. I don't know how well you can see this, but there's 15 books, full-length books, um, that we would be reading throughout the semester. So this was emailed to us two weeks before classes started, um, saying, hey, these are the books you need to purchase for class. We'll see you there. Make sure you read, um, I think we started with Thomas Kuhn, um, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions was our first book that we were going to read. And it was a challenge. Um, so I questioned whether or not I had made the right decision of going on for my PhD after reading all of this. Um, but I hear that's a normal process. So you go through all of this, and they break you down and build you back up by the time you get done with dissertation, and life is good. I also had to take a stats class. and. I had never taken a stats class. I don't even think I've taken math in, I don't even know how long. So learning statistics was gonna be interesting. However, I did have a research methods class here um, over in um, recreation management that gave us a glimpse of what SPSS was, which was a statistical, um, software that we'd be using. So I had sort of remembered what that looked like and kind of an idea of where I was going. Um, and I did put that to use here a couple times with doing a, a survey for the athletic department and stuff. So I thought maybe I could figure this out, but it's a whole different world of talking statistics and quantitative when you come from a qualitative world, um, which is more of the uh, rhetoric and um, descriptive information in the critical um, world. So classes for us, we're required to, our first semester classes are laid out for us. Second semester, two of our classes are laid out for us, but we only have to have nine credit hours a semester. So we get to take an optional course um, that second semester. 
And then our final two semesters, we get to kind of work in a um, cognate area, which is kind of like a minor um, and kind of where you want to be. So I was able to take several sports classes. Um, University of Tennessee does have a PhD program in the sports management department um, in the kinesiology um, aspect of it. So I've been able to take several classes over there, work with them, and still kind of keep my interest in sport alive. Um, however, my research area has shifted a little bit. Um, so I started seeing the statistic a lot. One in five women are targeted by sexual assault while in college. Um, you can help end sexual assault on campuses. And so I was kind of starting to get intrigued by that. And I was also getting intrigued by the media coverage that was going on around sexual harassment with the Stanford case, the um, Baylor case, the MSU case, and all of those. Um, and University of Tennessee also had a very large sexual harassment case going on. So I really wanted to look at what does this mean? Like, how is Title IX um, impacting all of this discussion? Because, um, oh, The Hunting Ground also came out about that time. How many of you guys have seen The Hunting Ground documentary? Okay, a couple. Um, so, you know, we start seeing all of this dialogue happening around it, and I wanted to know what universities were doing. What are they doing? Are they training? Are they talking? Are they having conversations? Are they not? Um, so I am currently working on several projects. Um, one with my advisor is doing a framing analysis, kind of looking at how the media frames Title IX um, and around the 40th anniversary coverage. So I've done that, um, and that one's almost ready to go to publication. The other one I'm doing um, right now is interviewing Title IX coordinators and looking at how are they training their students, their faculty, and their staff? And what is their investigation process like? And kind of how long have they been doing their, their processes um, and stuff? And so this week alone, I've had three interviews on that process. Um, and it's kind of nice that I can be at the University of Tennessee, but I can come up here and kind of do my research up here with the schools that are up here, go back to the University of Tennessee, and then when I write about it, they don't really know what schools I'm interviewing because ideally, you know, they would think that I'm doing around um, ten UT, um, Tennessee's state, um, but actually most of my schools are not in Tennessee. Um, and so my research is really focused on that. I'm also doing a usability, um, a website usability survey, which is looking at all of the colleges to see if they are Google searchable, and if their policies come up that way, and then if they have the information they're supposed to have according to Title IX, according to the Clery Act, and then if they are user-friendly, um, giving active links and those kind of things. Um, however, like this still ties back into sports because one of the high-risk areas that I'm talking to the Title IX coordinators about is what are you doing with Greek life, athletics and resident ha residence halls. Are you going out to them and giving them special training? Are you giving them, you know, those kind of trainings? Um, and, and surprisingly enough, athletics is being a little difficult. Um, but here's the, the 37 words that have kind of driven my research. Um, you know, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any, under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Um, so whether that's athletics or admission or um, sexual assault, pregnant, pregnant and parenting students, STEM, technology, any of those are all covered under Title IX. Um, in a lot of the interviews I've done the last couple of days, we've talked about what is this administration going to do with Title IX? Um, so I think, yep. So I'll leave that up. But I have, I'm open for any questions that you all might have um, about grad school, about research. 
Yeah. Now, you said you were talking to multiple universities on Title IX. Have you also had the discussion with them on how the universities are helping or hindering, like you hear in the case of Baylor and other schools where the Title IX offices have kind of been um, severely hindered in what they're supposed to do? And then um, what, are your, what have you currently seen outside? I, I know Title IX uh, just had the guidelines changed from the Obama administration. So uh, just those two quick things? Or, or um, so I am talking to universities kind of about the culture. So one of my questions is, is the culture on your campus willing and able to talk about sexual harassment and sexual assault? And that is where you get into, well, they are now, but they weren't you know, two years ago when I started this position. So a lot of schools are just starting to implement a Title IX coordinator um, position since 2011. Um, so we're only seven years into what does a Title IX coordinator do, what is their position, what is their role um, kind of thing. So a lot of schools are saying that they, are, they did experience difficulty when they started like this doesn't happen on our campus, this isn't those kind of things, and so they weren't getting the support. However, they've done climate studies on their own campuses, and it does come back that they're pretty much at the national standard of 20 to 25% of the women have been sexually assaulted at some point during their, their career. So they're able to use that data and go forward and get support from their administration. So I think these big cases like Baylor, Penn State, Florida State, um, UT have kind of driven some of the other schools scared of like, okay, we need to be doing something more than we are and we need to be more cooperative when they come to us saying we, we need to be doing this. Um, they are still struggling at getting into athletic departments. So there is still kind of that culture of we protect our own. And so they're still working there. Um, and I think that's where you see kind of the Baylor um, hang-ups of like not being able to get proper access to the proper people. Um, and then your second question was... Yes, so the transgender guidance of 2016 was the one that they have repealed, um, saying that all universities have to have a gender-neutral facility for, um, for transgender. Um, students. And that, that was the one guideline that has been repealed so far. Um, however, a lot of schools are still going ahead and trying to accommodate that. Um, schools in the South, however, are not so accommodating to that. Um, but right now, there's not a lot of activity in changes to the Title IX. They're more focused on creating the voucher system and the changes at the K through 12, um, so Title IX has kind of been able to sit quietly, um, but there, there is still fear that they will come after the 2011 guidance, um, which mandates schools to do investigations. So, um, but nothing has happened on that yet. So what else? Is anybody looking to go on for their masters? One, two, three, couple, all right. Are you guys junior, seniors? Okay. So applications have gone out, waiting to hear for some, the seniors. Okay. It's kind of nerve wracking, the waiting process, but April 15th we'll get here soon enough. All classes will be like Dr. All Spa's classes as you go forward. High reading levels, big writing, right? Nope, the extra credit goes away. Extra credit is no longer really a, a feature of um, grad school. It's just an expectation. Um, did, did you like working at Hope Network? I did. Yep. Um, Hope Network, uh, you know, I grew up there. I started there at 18 and worked there for 15 years. So it was definitely an eye opener um, in getting through that. And, I think they have a wonderful mission and do amazing work. Um, towards the end of it, I started working with the autistic kids and doing like that work, and that was hard but rewarding um, to be able to see some of those changes. Uh, I was just wondering, I'm shadowing um, occupational therapists there. 
this spring at Hope Network. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the rehab side um, is an amazing side. Um, Home Network is broken up into, I think, four different um, spectrums, um, and they have the brain injury and occupational. They have the developmental disabilities. They have the mental health side, and then they have their children. Um, and so I worked mostly with the mentally ill um, side of it, but I did dabble in um, the children's aspect of it, and then um, I worked with people who did the disability side of it throughout things. Yeah, have fun. So when like reflecting upon your schooling and stuff, what would you have done as an undergrad to better prepare yourself if you didn't feel as prepared to go on to you know, higher education or graduate programs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, reflecting back, um, I don't think I would have done anything different because I was a pretty active undergrad um, student with the RSO, getting out to conferences as soon as like they were offered, um, and volunteering and stuff. But just picking up um, my writing, reading, um, you know, you think that you do a lot of reading in undergrad, um, but it doubles at master's and quadruples at um, the PhD program. Uh, but I think being able to reflect on where your weaknesses are and know them going in um, kind of helps. Um, and then also being, being able to find a workload balance, work-life balance um, will be important going on. So um, I don't know if there is a work-life balance, but like finding a like 90-10, um, so you're not like 100% in work mode all the time. Um, you still have to remember that you're a student too and um, doing stuff, um, being involved. So are you thinking about going on? Did I see your hand go up? Yeah, I was thinking about going on. Just yeah? I don't want to miss those. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, somewhere. yeah absolutely. Um, so start that conversation um, with your coaching staff if you're working with Ferris here and start using their connections because it really is about who you know um, for those, those type of GTA positions. Um, but be open to doing um, an academic GTA, you know, for your first year to kind of get into school and, and then find a way into the athletic department. Okay. Besides your reading and the math that you had to do for your master's and now currently for your doctoral, what was the hardest thing you had to do for when you were doing your master's and what you're doing now with your doctoral? The hardest thing that I've had to do, um, I think, is balancing my role as a student and balancing my role as an instructor um, in the classroom has been the most difficult challenge for me. Um, because I do want to teach and I'm very passionate about teaching and so I want to be able to give 110% to that, but I also know that I have to give 110% to my studies. Um, and so being able to, to like stay off email or to put grading aside um, to kind of focus in on my own studies um, has been important and been my most difficult challenge um, because I want to succeed in the classroom and stuff, but you know, there's the demands of research and there's the demands of my own classwork. So finding that balance. Now you've done kind of the college touring or search three, at least three, four times now. What would you say is the best thing or how would you go about finding the right college for a student who's looking for a program? Because um, a lot of people here are doing kind of specialties and what they're looking at. And then you said there's multiple ways to make them pay for it, uh, or, well, to, to get financial support. What are other ways to do that? You mentioned there was a couple. Yeah, so for the search, um, for your master's program, it's important, for, for me, it was important to find, I think, somebody who was going to pay for it. Like, that's what I was thinking when I was going into my master's program, because I'd heard several times, like, don't pay for the advanced degree. Um, so I was kind of not really sure what the whole grad school thing looked like. I'm first generation to go to college, let alone on for advanced degrees. 
Um, so finding a program that would be flexible enough that I could still do the research that I wanted to do, but like focused enough to help guide me through the programs. That makes sense. So like I still had to be in an area that I was interested in, so communication was definitely my area of interest, but I didn't want to be pigeonholed into political science or political communication or um, a quantitative research. I'm very much through a critical lens when I come to research. And so I want to do more of an advocacy type research agenda. And so I had to find a program that would fit that. Um, what I found when I was looking at master's programs is if you're at a school that has a terminal master's program, you get treated like a PhD student. So you get the experience of being in a classroom and teaching. You get the one-on-one -on -one kind of advising um, that maybe you don't get if there's a master's and a PhD program. Um, but that's not true at all schools, but that's what I was finding as I was looking around. And that is kind of what happens at UT, because there's a master's program, and they kind of get the leftovers, and they're like TA for large lectures, but they're not really in the classroom or teaching where the PhD students are, so, and the funding is more for the PhD students than the master's students. So looking at those kind of things for your master's. For your PhD, that's a whole different ballgame. That, that you want to go to a school that has somebody who, will, who is in your research area, who's willing to work with you, and who kind of has the same outlook in your research. Um, in our cohort, there's 13 of us. Well, we're down to 11. Um, but they, there are some like myself, who came in knowing exactly the advisor I wanted to work with who I, and what I wanted to do. My track has been so much easier because I have that mentor type relationship with my advisor and she's guiding me and we're doing research together and we're working towards publication and getting me marketable for the job market where others who have come in have had to bounce around from a first year advisor to their <laughs> dissertation chair and it's just been a really rocky road of research for them and they don't have the publication pipeline that going. Um, so everybody that I've talked to since getting into a PhD program has really emphasized the importance of finding that person. Um, so if you're interested in um, sports and media analysis, Andy Billings at Alabama would be a good one to work with. Um, from his pipeline, you could work with Brandy Watkins at um, Virginia Tech. Um, so, you know, like kind of seeing who their students are and kind of reaching out sometimes, not to like that key person, but who are their students, because it's kind of like that family tree um, aspect of it um, is really important to that journey and to making it feel not so, so like debilitating at times. Like, you can really feel lost um, in the process. But if you have that great mentor advisor, and you have to write a letter of like why you're interested in the school, who you'd work with, what research you're going to um, contribute to when you're applying for PhD programs. So I think that's really important. Both, both. Um, so I started with the websites and going to well, I, actually, I started with who am I citing most in my research for my thesis, or like when I was working on different papers. Like, so who am I citing, and where are they at? And so then I looked at them, and you know, who are they working with in their paper kind of thing. Um, so uh, I was citing a lot of Marie Harding, because she kind of looks at um, the athletics and sports journalism and then Title IX and gender issues and that kind of stuff. And so I was citing her a lot and Aaron Whiteside's name started popping up all the time. And then um, when I realized that Aaron was at UT and then I looked at like the program, I was like, oh, Com Studies at University of Tennessee would be great. Um, it would be a great fit. And so I called her and said, asked her a slew of questions and then said, hey, can I come over? Because it was a four hour drive from Blacksburg to Tennessee. And then I went over there and I met with the 
dean of graduate stu studies. I met with the sports kinesiology program, and I met with all of them. So if you can afford to go to college like visits, go. Um, not all schools. I couldn't get up to Minnesota. Um, that was one school, but I did phone calls um, after looking at professors who were there and their research agenda and their vitas. I called and asked for phone interviews, emailed them, um, and had several phone interviews. So it, it becomes a combination. And the more active you are in the search, the happier you'll be in the end result. Yeah, yep. Um, so I came back from my internship in Hawaii. Uh, a couple weeks later, I jumped on a plane to Virginia Tech. Um, I went down there, asked all the questions, met with uh, Brandy Quisenberry, who was the um, director of public speaking, which is who does all of the GTA positions for that. Um, you know, just kind of got a feel for the program, the department. And again, I went on their list before I went down, pulled out all the professors that I thought would be a good fit for me in my research, and um, I met with them while I was down there. Professors are really, really eager to meet with pot potential students, um, especially if you're wanting to talk about their research. Like, they're very excited. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to email them, call them. Um, nine times out of ten, they'll, they'll take the time to talk with you. And it's really important, I think, to you. A, then you're not just a name that comes across on a paper, right? They've now all of a sudden they have a face to put with a name. They probably have a story. They understand you a little bit more. Um, and so you're no longer one applicant out of 300 that come through a program. You said you had to make a marketing plan for the um, internship you did in Hawaii. Were they actually able to implement anything that you recommended? For I created like a open house type marketing ploy to get people to actually come up to camp because it was in Makakilo and it was at the top of a mountain. And so it wasn't one of those really accessible places. And so we created a whole um, open house day and it had like different stations and the ropes course and the hike. and. So we kind of set up how that should rotate in the marketing. And so we sent out all the flyers. And um, it was actually really successful. They had over 300 people show up that day um, for just kind of the visitation and stuff. So the camp has actually closed. It closed last year, um, partly due to refocusing of energy. Um, so they, they decided that the camp wasn't making them enough money, so they do day camps at schools, um, kind of like the YMCAs around here, go into the public schools, and they thought that would be a better